Hi, and welcome to the Library 2035, Imagining the Next Generation of Libraries webcast series. My name is Sandy Hirsch, and I'm the editor of this book. I am pleased to host this webcast series featuring several of the book's contributing authors who will share their vision for libraries over the next decade. Today, I welcome Joyce Valenza and Deborah Cockle, the co-authors of Chapter 14, Future of School Libraries, It's About Equity. Joyce Valenza is an associate teaching professor and coordinator of the School Librarianship and LIS concentrations in the School of Communication and Information at Rutgers University. In this role, she prepares future librarians to lead cultures of literacy and engage communities. Previously, she enjoyed 40 years of practice as a school, public, and special librarian. Deb Cockle is an affiliate faculty for Antioch University, Seattle, with 30 plus years as a school librarian. She is active in state and national school library advocacy, and she earned AASL's Distinguished Service Award in 2014. She is the project director of an IMLS funded project slide, the School Librarian Investigation, Decline or Evolution. Throughout chapter 14, Joyce Valenza and Deb Cockle emphasize the struggle that school li libraries have in moving beyond inequities in school systems and communities. They offer several models to help address the disparities between students who have access to library programming and those who do not, including ensuring literacy instruction is taught, programs are built throughout collaborations, a pipeline of trained professionals is sustained into the future, and equitable practices are incorporated throughout the district. Of most importance, they call for advocacy to sustain efforts to ensure every student can have and can access the opportunities, resources, and instruction they rightfully deserve. It is my pleasure to welcome Joyce Valenza and Deb Cockle. Welcome. Thank you. Good to be here. <laughs> So I'd like to get started by asking you guys to describe what your vision is for the future of libraries in 2035. Well, I'll start, Sandy. Thank you. Um, I think that we have many possible futures, and it may look different in, in, in different environments and with different librarians. Um, I think it's up to us to be flexible and adaptable. Um, most of all, we need to understand the systems in which we operate. Our future is connected to our present, and it can change with the signals that we choose to observe in our own environments, the issues we choose to address, and the stories we tell around the evidence that we choose to discover. Um, in an early draft of our chapter, um, we opened and closed with a, a fable um, one of the one of the possible futures is resembles the uh, parable of the frog. Um, if you place a frog in a pot of boiling water, it will react quickly and jump out. But if you place that frog in a pot of cold water and slowly heat it, you'll eventually wind up with a boiled frog. <laughs> Our ability to recognize and respond to early signs of change and the threats around us is critical. We wanted to end with um, another fable, Aesop's Crow in the Pitcher, um, in which a thirsty crow wanted water from a pitcher. And what he did was he filled the peb he filled the pitcher with pebbles to raise the water level so he can drink. And what I think is exciting about that is there are pebbles around us too. How are we gathering them? What are the actions we're actually taking? And, and how are we avoiding complacency? That's great. That's those are really good and helpful parables for us to be considering. Deb, did you have something you wanted to add? I think uh, both Joyce and I are hoping uh, that our future involves all students in K twelve schools uh, being able to learn and grow through the opportunities that quality school libraries with certified school librarians can provide. And I think, you know, AASL, our organizations uh, and our state organizations, we are all moving in that direction and hope that all of our students, not just those that are in uh, wealthier or more endowed areas, uh, have quality school library programs. 
That's great. That's great. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, yeah. as we're looking into the future, are there things that concern you? And if so, what concerns you most? Well, I'll start. Um, one of the things that really flows through the chapter, and, and Deb alluded to it, is the notion of equity. And I view it as information privilege versus information poverty. We're seeing growing inequities. Um, from Deb's study, we found that 35% of all school districts no longer have any school librarians. We're also seeing fewer library programs, preparation programs for LIS. Um, we are, as a result of this, we're already beginning to see differences. Students are really differently prepared. I did a study that uh, is, was called First Years um, Meet the Frames, and in it, we compared the uh, confidence and competencies or the, the perceived competencies of students who had school librarians or high school librarians in their first year of college with students who did not. We called those students non-novice researchers. There were dramatic differences in um, their preparedness for the first year of college. This is really not fair. And Deb and I both are connected to Philadelphia, and I know she'll probably be talking about it later. But I, the, in the um, recent stories I've read in the Philadelphia News, we see that anywhere between only one librarian or maybe five librarians serving, um, Deb, was it 217 schools um, and 213,000 students. Can you imagine that? And can you imagine that compared with the Philadelphia suburbs, maybe two miles away from Philly, where those students have really rich, robust uh, libraries in terms of both their information, information access to, to physical and, pr and digital materials, as well as information experiences. And those experiences are so important um, as, they, as they meet the research process in their universities, if that's the, the route they choose. Yeah, the equity issue is huge. Uh, in our slide project, uh, we really drilled down into uh, different aspects, district and student demographics. Uh, what really struck me is Hispanic um, populations, majority Hispanic school districts really had the least uh, amount of, of school librarians. And uh, Joy said, you know, 35 percent of all U.S. school districts now have zero school librarians. But in addition to that, another 30 percent have one full-time or one part-time librarian for the entire district. And of course, where that lack of a school librarian occurs is really important. And we're seeing in majority Black and Hispanic uh, school districts, uh, very small school districts that can't afford or can't find through the pipeline issue uh, a certified school librarian. Um, and also, of course, the the growing disparity between the wealthy and the poor schools. Um, the slide project also looked at the impact of COVID. And what we're seeing now is a real uh, volatile environment. Some districts actually added a school librarian or part of a school librarian, but a lot of districts got rid of uh, library positions. What we don't know is as we're coming out of COVID, are those library positions going to be reinstated? But the interesting fact uh, that we found in the slide project when we studied a, a time span of four years, that districts that had no school librarians, uh, only one out of 10 districts reinstated a school librarian during that four year time period. So if that trend holds true, all of those school librarian positions that were lost during COVID are unlikely to come back. So we really have an issue here of the equity and we know what type of schools lose school librarians the most. And so you well, said- that 
I'm just, go ahead. You know, I, I, wait, wait, I think this was the the challenge to us as we wrote this chapter, um, because there really are two different futures. The future, as Gibson said, really is unevenly distributed. Well, thank you. Uh, that is all very concerning. I'm hoping with my next question, you can give us a little ray of hope. Um, what are you excited about for the future of libraries? Well, I am thrilled with the opportunities that we have to teach about new literacies. AI literacy is going to be a really important one for us to address. I have been all over that, responding to knee-jerk reactions from um, some districts that are trying to ban AI much in the same way that we tried to ban calculators in the in the past. Um, you know, I, I don't see See this, I see this as an opportunity for librarians to lead. I see um, we can really influence an entire school community in creating assessment level um, guidelines for, for productive and ethical use of AI. Um, I see us also having new opportunities. There are um, at least one, possibly two information literacy bills now being passed um, in, in ensuring that our students have information literacy experiences in their K-12 programs. And we, in, in the article, we mentioned programs like the program in Boston and in New York City that are really actively addressing the pipeline issue, showing that um, pivots are possible and that new groups of librarians can be trained and, and that folks are really addressing any of the barriers. This has to be done in, in certainly in more communities. Uh, one of the things <clears throat> that I am uh, most excited about, both Joyce and I teach in university programs that prepare school librarians. And uh, I am so excited when I see the quality of the candidates that we see coming into our programs. I mean, a lot of these are very experienced teachers. They already have master's degrees in other areas. Some even have doctorates. And they're coming into our program because they're realizing they want to go beyond the classroom and they see the school library as an opportunity to impact widely all the students, all the teachers, and even the administration, community, school board. Um, they see it as a real leadership position. And I find that very exciting. Their community engagement <laughs> and there's a lot of sec the second career people have a really impressive. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's no problem. Um, so what do you think has had the biggest impact? Um, what do you think? Has, I'm sorry. What do you think has had the biggest impact on libraries over the past decade? I think it's technology for me. I mean, it's an area that I study an awful lot. Um, and I think one of the problems that I see relating to technology is the need to continually retool. The heuristics that a lot of librarians um, learned when they came out of library school, um, I mean, my first gig in library school was in the 70s. If I did not continue to retool, I'd be a goner. Uh, but, but I'm, you know, and still seeing it, it was even on the ASL, um, list this morning. Uh, people were recommending all of these websites to use for evaluation that are hoax sites. When, why aren't we evaluating the information that is out there? So this need to retool, to lose the crap test and the checklist and do lateral reading, um, as the Shegg study suggested, it's important. We shouldn't demonize Wikipedia. It's not a binary of not to use it or not use it. It's, it's not whether, but when and how we should use it. Um, and we're facing, you know, a, a very important election. Our students need these skills and their skills have have to be connected to news literacy vocabularies that maybe librarians did not know um, as they, there, there's, there is an entirely new vocabulary. The landscape is so much more nuanced than it was 10 years ago um, that it's just, I can't think of anything bigger than that, but Deb probably can. <laughs> well, to me, especially uh, having come through the three-year slide project, I tend to look at the school library profession a little 
broader. And what I have seen over the past decade is the issue with unfair school funding. And this really cuts to the core of being able to have quality school librarians and being able to hire certified school librarians. Um, you know, as the funding becomes very um, different for wealthy areas and poor areas, um, we are seeing a real disservice to our students. And until both federally and at the state level and even local, until those levels begin to make education a real priority and fund it the way it should be, you know, we're going to continue to have uh, these inequities that are really difficult to deal with. Um, in this slide <clears throat> project, we interviewed 49 uh, school administrators, most of them were superintendents, a uh, few school board people, several principals, and they kept coming back to the issue um, of particularly in school districts uh, that had cut positions. They said, hey, we want school librarians. The issue is we cannot afford them. And because we are placed in a position now where we have other priorities like safety in school buildings is pulling funds away from the normal education process. Um, we have students who need to be fed. We have medical issues that we have to address with our students. And these take priority over having a quality school library program. So until the federal and state funding begins to address all those needs of our, our growing diverse K-12 population, um, you know, we are not going to be able to address the adequacies uh, in school library programs. So, you know, I call upon our legislators to start to make uh, kids a priority. And what do you think will have the biggest impact uh, on libraries in the next decade, in the next 10 years? Well, I kind of think that's the same question for me. I think it comes down to funding. We have to see, um, you know, we have some really important uh, presidential elections coming up, even at the state level. Uh, and, you know, I live outside of Philadelphia. We just um, got a brand new city council. Uh, the city council and the mayor's office will decide what the school district um, school board looks like. I mean, all of those political issues, school librarians need to be involved in. Uh, I teach a school library advocacy course uh, in, at Antioch uh, University, Seattle, and I am uh, surprised how a lot of the students that I have have never engaged in a lot of uh, political advocacy for students, and it's an area that we really have to get tough on. Joyce, did you have anything you wanted to add? I, I agree completely with Deb. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Excellent. Well, do you have any advice for information professionals as they look toward the future? I'm so glad you asked that question, Sandy. I do. <laughs> um, I, I think that we have to expect excellence of ourselves and others. Um, and as Deb said, we need to be activists for young people. We need to engage in student-centered activism. Um, let this be our mantra. I want to do what's right for our learners and passion is passion for kids is what's going to make things happen. Um, I think that we have to be visible. Um, one of the, one of the studies I did um, over the last couple of years had to do with how librarians um, reacted and served their school communities during COVID. And I discovered, it, it, you can find the article in Eric, I, dif I discovered how much these librarians were contributing. When we asked this group of librarians, did you write a report? 
Not a single one of them wrote a report about it. This evidence completely disappeared like water dripping out of a faucet. And it, it was, it's so frustrating. So I think that um, we have, our, our, I see, and I also see library websites that are nothing more than brochures. These have to be rich, meaningful destinations rather than do- brochures. Virtual practice is here to stay, connecting barrier-free, in integrating with learning management systems. Um, we have to be discoverable. We have to be meaningful. We need to be connected to learning goals embedded across the curriculum. And there are many ways to make that elevator pit pitch. I know, Deb, that we can talk about that. This, this transparency is really important. And we have to align our work to the larger mission and vision of our schools and our districts. It is so easy to connect that. Um, I, Deb reminded me of something that I was talking about years ago. What I would do was go into my principal every time I had a new principal, and that happened pretty often, um, and say, what keeps you up at night? How can me and the library help you solve the problems that you see in our community? The principal knew immediately that the library was their, well, was their ally. Um, and it, 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 cause I think I got this from Deb advocacy is solving other people's problems and the library can solve a lot of problems. Yeah, I completely agree with that. My advice um, to librarians is get out of your silo. (laughs) You know, as long as you close the library door and you do your little thing in that room with kids, and I'm not saying that's not important, it certainly is. But if you don't get out of that room and share what you're doing with teachers, administrators, parents, nobody knows what you're doing. And it's very easy to cut programs and people when no one knows what you're doing. And my other piece of advice, especially to new school librarians, is start to make your professional network. You know, join your local and state school library associations, join AASL and ALA, and take advantage of all the professional development trainings, the journal articles, get involved actively on the committees, because most times you are the only school librarian in your building. And what Slide even found out is sometimes you're the only school librarian in your entire district. So you need to get out there and network with like-minded people that are doing the same kind of work so that you can share ideas, build off of one another. And, you know, uh, when you work with legislators, if one person comes in and talks about an issue, so what? If 50 people come in and talk to that legislator about the issue or send emails or write letters, suddenly it gets on somebody's agenda. So we have to organize and we have to work within our communities. Yeah, that community also includes their parents, the local businesses. I I think that um, having when you have groups of parents with you and their children are library ambassadors themselves and they go home talking about the library all the time, those parents are going to be advocates for you when a book challenge comes around, um, when a a, a defunding effort starts. I know that you're an expert in, in, in building these stakeholder groups. So, and it, it's it's not okay not to be political anymore. Right. Yeah, I currently am working with a group called Parcel. Uh, it stands for the Philadelphia Alliance to Restore School Librarians. And we now have a grassroots group of over 900 people. And we are lobbying the school board, the city council, our state representatives, Uh, And we are starting to build an energy and the district is finally sitting down and saying, yeah, I think maybe the equivalent of one school librarian for our 217 schools is not fair. 
And so they are sitting down with us and we are trying to work through this issue. We're writing grants. We're trying to get state funding. And it takes a great deal of effort to undo uh, what has been done in a large urban district like Philadelphia. Back in the 1990s, they had a librarian in every single school. So you see what has happened over time, and it's going to take us a lot of work and a lot of time to get back to that level. And I want to say that for those people who are re- who are listening to this podcast who are not school librarians, this impact is something you're going to see in your public libraries and certainly in the academic libraries. You are going to see these these vast differences, these discrepancies in preparedness or even library awareness. And this library awareness will affect libraries in terms of funding public libraries and academic libraries as well, because those kids who fall in love with their school libraries are also going to be advocates for public and academic libraries. And I also think that Deb represents this this wave. There's Liz in Boston and Casey, and and I'm going to leave out important names, but that team in D.C., stuff is happening, and it's possible to pivot. You may have already addressed this in your comments already, but is there anything else that information professionals can do to better prepare for their desired future? Wow, I really think we hit hit a lot of. Them. I feel you um, did too, so that's why I'm just I mean, checking. Yeah, I, you know, build build your advocacy and leadership skills, and get out there and build alliances and partnerships with parents and and businesses and uh, people outside your usual education circle. Get out there. Make sure that all of your goals and objectives are learner-centered or human-centered. You should not go into a school board meeting and say, I want a makerspace. But in what way is that makerspace and the tinkering that children do in that space going to inspire mechanical thinking, um, design thinking? Um, you have to be able to make these connections to learning. In addition, I am seeing a lot of annual reports that just are about numbers without the story behind the numbers. What do those numbers mean? What is the context and what is the story you can tell? I don't care that you circulated 5,000 books. Is that who's reading those books? What's the change from last year? Um, and I, They're pretty. They're made in Canva, but they don't tell the story. So I think you also may have already addressed this, but I wondered if there were key competencies that you wanted to uh, talk more about that you think librarians will need to thrive in 2035. Well, you know, I I did have said um, advocacy skills. A lot of programs are not preparing our students with strong advocacy skills. And so they've got to learn them on their own, maybe through professional networks or from their state and federal school library associations. But, um, you know, no other teacher has to justify their job like a school librarian. Like a math teacher doesn't have to go to the school board and, and present how how they're really impacting students and why their job needs to be continued. But school librarians do. So we are different in that way. And um, people really need to develop those strong communication skills uh, and leadership skills and and really uh, get out there and address all those stakeholders that really can influence the amount of resources staffing and funding that the school library has. And I think the ability to get a seat at the table, um, you need to volunteer for those key committees. You may be overwhelmed, but prioritize um, the things that have impact in your world. 
It may not be important to do inventory. It may not be important to weed the entire collection. It is important to be on the curriculum committee. It is important to visit with the PTA or the PTO. It is important to build relationships. Uh, and, and I don't know, you know, we go about our day thinking that um, everything is just fine. We pat ourselves on the back that we're good librarians. But in what ways can we grow? In what ways can we make be- bigger contributions than than the ones that are just within our four walls? Because there are needs, there are, there are problems that are that are looking for solutions, and librarians are really in a in a, in a great spot uh, to make change and to innovate and to lead schools. But we can't do that if we just go about the path that we're we're walking each day. You both are so inspiring and you've uh, shared with so much wisdom today. So I'm so happy we're having this conversation. I have one last challenge for you um, as we wrap up our conversation. And that is, you know, to, I'm asking you to define your view of the future of libraries in six words or less. Well, I would say build partnerships locally, at the state level, and federally. I would say political activism is a job essential. Excellent. Well, thank you, Joyce, Valenza, and Deb Cockle for joining me today. And I really enjoyed talking with you. And thank you for your contribution to Library 2035, Imagining the Next Generation of Libraries. It's been such a pleasure and uh, it's been so inspiring to hear you share your vision for the future of libraries. So thank you. Thanks so much for being part of this. Thank you. And thank you for attending this webcast with Joyce Valenza and and Deborah Cockle, um, co-authors of chapter 14, Future of Libraries, It's About Equity. To view additional author webcasts for this Library 2035 webcast series, please visit visit the link or use the QR code on your screen. And thank you again for attending.